Uh, the main thing I would like to do today is just quickly touch upon Shelterbox, who we are, what we do, and then jump right into my deployment in the Philippines, which happened just two weeks after my visit with you. So uh, first of all, Shelterbox is an organization that grew out of Rotary. In the year 2000, Rotary International challenged every Rotary club uh, throughout the world uh, to come up with a Millennium Project. And a little club in Helston, Cornwall, England, a little club of 15 members, came up with the concept of Shelterbox. It was actually something that had been generated by one of the members. They brought this uh, particular concept to the forefront and made it their club project. Later that year, our first deployment took place in Gujarat, India, and actually Ron was with Mercy Corps uh, at that time, was actually there as well. Uh, since that first deployment, Shelter Box has had 250 deployments. Uh, we are a very small organization on the humanitarian scene, but now we're the largest provider of emergency shelter um, in, uh, in the world. Um, again, something that grew out of Rotary, and Rotary has stayed very close to our core through this. And what I really want to do today is talk about how Rotary not only helps us um, financially, but also helps us on the ground, because more than half of our deployments come about as a result of a Rotarian picking up a phone someplace in the world and saying, we've got a crisis and nobody is helping. And I'll show you a couple of examples uh, in a moment as to where that has happened in, in our news most recently. But uh, Shelterbox focuses on the most vulnerable uh, families in, in disaster. Um, these are the people whose lives are in jeopardy without shelter. It could be pregnant women, it could be women uh, such as here in Haiti who have small families. Um, it could be the elderly, it could be the sick, the maimed, the injured. But uh, again, we focus on providing shelter quickly to those um, who are the most fragile in the community. Um, we have a reputation of being amongst the first on site. Um, in Haiti, as an example, we were the first to be delivering aid in Haiti from outside of Haiti. A number of organizations were already in Haiti at the time of that earthquake. Uh, shelter Box was the first to actually have aid on the ground. That came about because every English naval vessel carries 150 to 200 shelter boxes. At the time that earthquake took place, the humanitarian world realized this was going to be a big event. Um, as our first responders were being deployed off of the East Coast, uh, the, uh, the English Navy was deploying two cruisers that happened to be in the Caribbean at the time to Port-au-Prince. So our first boxes actually went to the hospital teams. Sons International or Red Cross International. Um, I, I don't recall whether your organization got our tents, but in many cases, uh, it was two to three weeks after the event before uh, many of the medical teams were able to get their equipment on the ground. Um, our equipment consists of a big green box, which again, you may have seen in that box, are all of the non-food items a family needs for their survival. The key, of course, is the tent. Uh, the tent in the Philippines on my most recent deployment was housing families averaging uh, seven to 10. Uh, it's a very large tent, very technical tent uh, from the standpoint of its durability. Um, the other piece, water filtration system, blankets, mosquito nets. Uh, the, really, one of the most important pieces uh, are the tools for recovery. It's our point of view that emergency shelter should be available immediately, but that family should be working to get themselves into transitional or permanent housing as quickly as possible. And providing them for the, with the tools to do that um, enables them to get started sooner. Uh, it is really a high quality kit. Uh, you can see here the cookware is stainless steel. Long after the tent's been used, going back and doing assessments and follow-up, we find that that cookware is still being used. The water filter is still being used. We have solar lamps that come with this kit, they're still being used. Uh, the tent itself, again, is uh, almost eight feet high, 220 square feet in the Philippines. In the region I was in, the average home uh, was about 280 square feet. In this part of the world, the families do not live in their homes the same way we do. Uh, the climate's uh, too conducive to being outside. 
Uh, they sleep in their homes. Uh, they might have a cook kitchen outside the home, but the actual place they sleep is not much bigger than this tent. Uh, our equipment is deployed by first responders. Uh, we have about 200 of them worldwide. The, uh, there's about 50 in North America, like myself. Most of these, all of these are volunteers. Most of them are Rotarians. Uh, typical age of our, of our first responders is in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. They've got everyday jobs just like you do, but they've worked it out with their bosses so they can maybe take the vacation to go on deployment. Uh, we typically get a phone call. For instance, uh, I was in Eugene working with the Eugene Delta Rotary Club on an event that they were putting on. Uh, on a Friday, when I got the telephone call that I needed to start making my way toward the Philippines and be there by Sunday. It was not possible for me to do it that quickly. I arm wrestled a bit and I was able to get there on Monday. But bottom line is typically we have 36 to 48 hours. And when you consider the Philippines a 32 hour plane trip, it doesn't leave a lot of time to get things closed up at home. So again, for somebody like myself who's retired, it's a little bit easier to do that. For somebody who's working, that's a real challenge, particularly somebody who's got a family. Uh, so this is a great commitment on these people's parts. Um, again, our job is to shepherd the equipment. That is to get it through customs, to get it out into the field, to get it up to the families that are the most deserving and meet our criteria. Um, we have deployed, as I mentioned before, uh, 250 times to almost 100 countries, including North Korea. We've been in North Korea twice in the last year. We're one of the few agencies in the world that's ever been able to get into North Korea. We were in Myanmar very early in the game before most other organizations were able to get in. We worked very closely with the United Nations and Human Re uh, Refugee Council because they know our connection with Rotary. And they know through that connection we can do things that other organizations can't do, North Korea being one of them. The Shanghai Rotary Club, which is made up of non-PATs because the Chinese government doesn't allow their citizens to be involved with organizations of any kind, um, were contacted um, by us asking if they had anybody at the highest level in, in uh, the Chinese government that might be able to help us get into um, North Korea. The United Nations had come to us just uh, literally two days prior to our call to them. Uh, within 30 hours, we were standing on the North Korean border, uh, the guests of the North Korean government. Um, the tragedy that unfolded there was something that none of us have heard of in all probability, but there had been a very significant typhoon that had happened six months prior. We were called in now in December, and we all know what the weather's like in North Korea. And think about December, sub-zero temperatures. Thousands of people have lost their homes and they're living exposed. People are dying of exposure. Our tents were apt, absolutely critical to their survival. By the way, our tents contain a thermal liner as well that can be added into them. So in cold climates, they really are able to be very effective. In November of this last year, uh, we were watching a tropical depression that very quickly blew up to become Typhoon Haiyan or Yolanda, as it's called in the Philippines. It struck November 8th, the morning of November 8th, the largest, most powerful storm to ever hit a landfall. The lowest recorded air pressure ever recorded on Earth. It was a massive event. Uh, we all saw on television, followed for weeks, really, uh, the tragedy and uh, the ordeal that the Philippine people were going through. I don't, I, you're well versed on that. I'm not going to spend time on that today. I'm really going to go into what Shelterbox did in, in light of this event. Um, there were 13 million people impacted. The Philippines is a very densely populated country, a country of approximately the same square miles as the state of New Mexico. I believe New Mexico has about two million people, two and a half million people. The Philippines in the same square footage has just under 100 million people. Um, a storm of this magnitude uh, impacted um, three million people from the standpoint of displacing them from their homes. Um, there were, the real critical thing for Shelterbox is there were just under a half a million homes damaged, 50% of those totally. 
Our very first deployment for this event was on the island of Bontanian. Uh, 23,000 people, 95% um, of the homes were washed away in a tidal surge. So effectively, everybody lost their home. Um, and this happened, this was replicated on island after island as we uh, dug deeper and deeper. Um, so the event, again, um, came across here again is, is um, the Philippines, uh, Vietnam, China, um, came across the islands between the two big islands, the large island of Luzon, where Manila is, the island I was on the year before, Mindanao, um, is to the south. Um, it came right up through these islands. 7,000 islands, by the way, make up the Philippines. So a lot of them are very small. Hit Leyte. We all saw the damage on Leyte, but just continued with the same devastation across this region. The problem the storm caused was it lingered. Typically, a cyclone moves at 15 to 17 miles an hour. This particular typhoon lingered over some of these islands for more than an hour and a half with winds up to 200 miles an hour. Literally nothing could withstand uh, that intensity. Um, when the event happened, we quickly realized Leyte was no place we belonged. Um, first of all, the airport was out. There was really no way for us to get there. Secondly, these people needed food, water, and medicine before they needed shelter. We don't want to be part of the problem. And many times, uh, that's an assessment that humanitarian agencies have to make. Are you going to solve a problem or are you going to create a problem? And we felt we would create a problem. So we were very familiar with the area, being on the island of Bolhol at the time the storm struck with an earthquake that had hit two weeks before. We realized that even though the airport was out at Leyte, within three hours after the passing of the storm, the airport was open uh, in Cebu City. So we immediately took boxes that we had stored in uh, Clark Freeport, which is the old Clark Air Force Base, have about 3,500 boxes stored there at all times. Um, loaded them on a, on a Philippine uh, Army C-130. They were flown to Cebu City. Now it comes into play. We're now 12 weeks away from the event. And normally, shelter boxes come and gone within 12 weeks. Uh, but the magnitude of this storm was such that we were just getting started 12 weeks out. I get my call. I show up at Cebu City, where I began to uh, work with uh, Stephen uh, Costello, who owns a company, he's, uh, he's a food producer and a food manufacturer, um, who owns a company on Cebu Island. He also happens to be the past president of the Cebu Rotary and the past district governor. Uh, Stephen agreed to uh, transport our equipment via his ferries that were taking food every day from Cebu City to Ilo Ilo on uh, the island of Panay. That's where I was headed. I was informed that I would be taking care of logistics. Um, and so Stephen again started our boxes flying to Panay. Again, all gratis. Um, an incredible, an incredible gesture on his part because um, it would have been an extremely expensive venture for, under, for us to undertake this independently. Um, so I arrive in, in, um, I arrive now in Pan A, and uh, within hours I'm at the Rohe City Rotary Club meeting that evening, and I'm visiting with members who turn out to be critical to show our boxes ability to quickly get equipment into the field. But very candidly, this is how it typically happens. In most cases, we work with rotary rather than government agencies because we find we can do things far more quickly and efficiently. But B-Boy right here had great contacts with uh, provincial governors, with mayors of municipalities, with barangay captains. Consequently, we were able to get in touch with people at the highest levels to identify where the greatest needs were on the island of Panay. Christine, a registered nurse, a member of the club as well, organized a group of 28 volunteer nurses who um, were able to go out and do the assessments to determine, who, to determine who truly is the most needy. We asked the barangay captains 
uh, within each of the communities to identify who met our criteria. But we knew there'd be way too much favoritism and way too much politics in that decision. decision. So we took their names and then we sent the nurses out to do an independent assessment. They called it, that, called it down by about 90% and we got to the people who were truly in the greatest need. Christine again uh, did a super job along with her full-time job of assisting us. Uh, Dale Burris right here uh, has a trucking company and through his contacts and competitors, they agreed to truck our equipment from Ilu Ilu to the World Food Bank Warehouse in Rohe City where the municipalities then picked up the equipment to take into their communities. And then Doc right here worked with us in terms of infectious disease and uh, other issues from a health standpoint. The Philippines, although it does not have uh, rampant malaria, does have dengue, uh, does have uh, elephantitis and other mosquito-borne illnesses, um, and he was uh, very helpful in uh, helping us determine really where we should go and where we could safely go. Uh, so, again, we, we uh, prior to the storm, we're in a very rural area in the Philippines. Uh, Two-thirds of the houses are bamboo houses, which quite candidly stand up very well in typhoons, but not when typhoons are nearly 200 miles an hour. So this was a typical type of home. This is what it looked like after the storm. You'll note our tent set up in conjunction. Typically, we like to get the tent set up as close to the home as possible to hopefully take advantage of water and, and uh, latrine or bathroom, as well as allow the recipients to work on rebuilding uh, their home. Uh, so bamboo didn't hold up very well, but uh, concrete held up even worse. Uh, substandard concrete, little rebar, uh, typical throughout the third world. Uh, but in this particular case, when you've got 180 to 200 mile an hour winds buffeting for any period of time, it's like a sledgehammer hitting something. And it just pulverized these buildings. Here again is a classic example of how we like to set the tents up in conjunction with uh, the home that was lost. Now, feeding logistics, and Ron can uh, attest to this, uh, although airplanes and helicopters are terrific, uh, when you really want to get into the most remote areas, they're, in most cases they're totally ineffective and, and far too expensive uh, to use. So uh, sometimes low tech is really the best way to be effective. So uh, I went about securing all kinds of low-tech transportation, again, to get the equipment out to these families. Um, the, uh, on many of the islands, the best way to do it was on longboat catamarans. And here we set up a human chain, one of our SRTs is receiving a tent, handing it off to the next person for about 50 yards uh, to get it into shore. Uh, water buffalo are still the main form of, uh, of everything from uh, transportation to working the fields, and in many cases, uh, getting the tents out on water buffaloes was effective. Uh, while I was working on the logistics in terms of getting the equipment ordered and out, uh, we, the, another part of my team was actually out in the field, identifying the communities that have the greatest need, uh, working up memorandums of understanding with the mayors and other local officials, uh, to determine what they were going to do, what we were going to do. It's very important in humanitarian, when delivering humanitarian aid, that you've got partnership with the community. This isn't about you. This isn't about what you have to offer. It's about how can you meet, best meet their needs. So you've got to listen to the community, and you've got to uh, have the community buy into what you're doing. It would be wrong. It would be morally wrong for us to deliver this kind of equipment into a community and not have the community bought into it when the most fragile in the community are getting the equipment, others are not, turmoil is going to take place. Perfect example, we're one of the largest providers of, of humanitarian aid right now in Syria. We were originally delivering our tents. Our tents were found to be very mobile and of such high quality, the Syrian army wanted them. So they were taking them away from our recipients. We now provide the United Nations tent the standard United Nations relief tent, which weighs about 350 pounds. It's something nobody wants unless they have no alternative. Um, and especially uh, the, uh, the Syrian army. So the recipients are not being harassed and uh, losing their, their housing. 
Uh, we also work with teams here, uh, Boy Scouts, Boy Scouts Internationally as a partner, just like Rotary International as a partner. Uh, the Boy Scouts are learning how to put the tents up. They then go into the community and erect the tents. Biggest challenge we had was weather, it continued to rain. Finding enough dry land and flat land, debris free land, was a huge challenge. A perfect example, this was a picture taken the morning after the storm. Christine is standing on the site of her home. Uh, this is what we left her with. Um, and she elected not to rebuild in that location, by the way, because it was so vulnerable. But uh, temporarily, it served as a good pad uh, for her home. Typical recipient, a family of 10 um, who have received the tent, milk the baby, uh, baby Yolanda. We've met a lot of baby Yolandas, uh, all named after the storm. Uh, for those of you that were old enough to have uh, experienced the Columbus Day storm in this part of the world, uh, there was a phenomenon that took place during the Columbus Day storm, that is an inordinate amount of babies were born during that storm. The air pressure differential causes the amniotic sac to break, and there were thousands and thousands of babies born in this region during the storm or just after. So it was important to get them into housing. Uh, this was a blind lady that one of our, one of our um, responders found. Uh, probing for the entry of her home. Her home was the collapsed roof of her house. Um, obviously somebody that needed better housing. A young family who again had a child born during the storm showing how they've adapted the tent to be home. Another way the tent gets used. Uh, clinics and hospitals, particularly early in the game. Um, this is, uh, the Filipinos are so resourceful, and this was a lady who was a sole provider for her family, had a little convenience store, it was lost, so she turned the front of her tent into the convenience store. Uh, again, disabled, um, elderly. Um, oftentimes, we were the biggest show in town when we would show up, and we'd have, we'd have a built-in audience. And here were the young children of uh, Eva, who was uh, the recipient of the tent. She had lost her husband during the storm, had three young children. Um, she's embracing me at this point. I've just given her her certificate of ownership. One of the things we do when we give a tent out is we let the recipients know that this tent is being given to them by donors from around the world and how Rotary plays into that. And um, we give them this this certificate of ownership. She had reached around and was hugging me at the time this picture was taking, taken, saying, my home, my home, this is the first new thing I've ever owned. Um, you just, it really helps put things in perspective. Um, and when you have those kinds of situations take place, you can't believe what that does for you. Um, so anyway, uh, Rotary. Rotary in action. We saw lots of instances throughout the deployment where Rotary is at work. Here was a, a group of high school Rotaract kids who were repacking rice at one of the rice centers. Um, we saw several instances of this. Um, we uh, also had wonderful hospitality by the Philippine people. If any of you have ever been to the Philippines, uh, you'll know what I'm talking about here, but there are not more gracious and wonderful people in the world than the Philippine people. Um, and one of the things that happens is no matter how rich or how poor, they want to reward your good work with food. And typically when I'm on deployment, I lose five to seven pounds. This time I came home weighing seven pounds more than when I left. <laughs> and my wife accused me of not really being on deployment. But the reality of it was, I ate myself across the Philippines, oftentimes five meals a day. Uh, you just simply couldn't turn the hospitality away. And as I said, in the poorest communities, uh, they're, they're roasting a pig and they're doing things that you just can't imagine um, in, in order to reward you for the help. Um, on my very last day, we found 48 families living on a remote island that up until two days before had had no assistance. They had lost everything. All their homes were gone. Um, and uh, a group had found them, notified us that they needed some help. They needed temporary shelter while permanent housing was being built. And so uh, this was their response to uh, Shelterbox and to Rotary International thanking us for the job we were doing. As I mentioned, 
um, we continue to be hard at it. Here we are in Bosnia uh, and uh, Serbia uh, just uh, two weeks ago with the flooding. Um, here we are in Zimbabwe um, last week, again with extended, extended flooding. Uh, here we are in Shelley at the request of a Rotary member. Massive fires um, and uh, providing housing for those who lost their homes to the fires. Here we are in Bolivia three weeks ago, still there. Bolivia had massive floods that simply the government and the world did not respond to. And a frustrated Rotarian called us in uh, Hilston, Cornwall to uh, tell us of what was going on. We sent an assessment team down, quickly realized there was a need, worked through Oxfam and a couple of other organizations to get additional help into the area uh, and meet the needs. Hundreds of thousands of people were displaced in this event. Syria, as I mentioned, continues to be ongoing. Two years ago, we were invited to help when there were 30,000 refugees. Today, there's 2.4 million. Um, and uh, of the 21 million people that uh, are uh, uh, in Syria, um, 7 million of them are displaced. So a third of the total Syrian population is dis displaced, most of it internally. The world doesn't realize that. It's a it's a humanitarian issue of unbelievable proportion. The good work that Rotary is doing with the Polio Now program um, in eradicating polio has festered itself in these camps in Syria. Again, uh, it's something that has to be dealt with. Uh, the future, shelter box. Um, on average, since inception, shelter box has provided about 10,000 of the most vulnerable families a year with housing. They share alone 7,500 people in the Philippines. Um, in in uh, Haiti in 2010, 32,000 families, 330,000 people were housed in shelter box tents. Um, today, 100,000 of those people are still living in, in these tents. Um, the need is far greater than what we've been able to provide. Our goal is to, within five years, be able to provide 50,000 shelter boxes a year. To do that, we're going to need more support. Um, one of the major ways that we receive our support is, is through uh, sponsorship of boxes. Rotary clubs throughout the world provide about 40% of our financial support. Um, and in most cases, do it with the purchase of a shelter box. The shelter box uh, provides uh, that Rotary Club with a tag that allows them to follow that box into employment so they know where it goes. Uh, you can go to our website at any given time and you can actually track where your box is. Um, that thousand dollars, by the way, covers everything um, in terms of what's in the box uh, right through getting it to the family. Um, and again, another way that uh, you can sponsor, and this is a big way it was done with the Philippines, is through what's called shoulder box solutions. A tent is $500, the tool kit is $50, the water filtration kit is $75. Uh, um, District 5100 and District 5101, uh, the two primary Oregon districts, uh, provided, generously provided, almost $100,000 within a six week period for the Typhoon uh, Haiyan event this past year. Rotary in the United States provided over a million dollars in that same period of time. So again, um, huge, huge supporter um, of us financially, but we're asking for more because the need is just so great. Uh, we're a charity navigator, four star organization, similar to Rotary International. Uh, we are as transparent and as financially prudent as, as can be because our roots are Rotary, because most of our participants are Rotarians, and most of them are small business people. They take this charge on uh, with that same fiduciary attitude responsibility. And it comes about because of the generosity of Rotarians, both up front in financial sponsorship, but just as importantly, out in the field. When we've got people like uh, Steve Costello again in the Philippines offering his services, that would have been thousands of dollars for us to achieve that. So again, um, 
We are, we are rotary driven. We're, we're um, effective because of rotary. The, the, at the end of the first week, I was in a cluster meeting, a shelter cluster meeting. All of the uh, organizations that participated in the event meet um, by category, uh, medical, uh, water, food, shelter. The shelter cluster that I was part of, um, I gave my report and the question came up from international organizations that you're all very familiar with, how did we get so much done so quickly? And I said just one word, rotary. Simple as that, rotary. We're able to be on the ground and doing things much more quickly than most organizations because we're small, because we're nimble, and because of rotary.